The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, currently, we're doing a study to prepare our hearts to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. I really want us to understand the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I hope you've noticed that no matter what your conscience issue is about what to do with Christmas, uh, no matter where you're at in that journey, my focus has been on the incarnation. It's been on the focus of the fullness of time that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a, a focus that should take up our hearts daily and continually. It's, it's a focus that we are all unified who are believers in Jesus Christ. So I pray that, that we're all being edified in our series and that as we journey through this uh, season together, things like, should we celebrate Christmas or not? Uh, how should we do it? Santa Claus or not Santa Claus or, are not what the kingdom of God is about. <laughs> are you with me? But love and joy and peace and the Holy Spirit. So don't strain gnats and swallow camels. Uh, Romans 14, I told you I would preach that every year and I'm delinquent. It's been a while. But that's a, a conscience issue chapter. And in that chapter, what Paul gets into, they're, they're arguing whether you should eat meat or not that's been sacrificed to an idol. And Paul says there's only one command in there at the beginning is receive one another. And that word is into your family, into the, the closeness. So when you differ on conscience issues, what he wants is receive one another. Don't let those things become dividing points among you. Receive and love one another. And he says, don't judge one another on these issues or condescend one another. Don't look at someone and say, oh, that poor person can't celebrate Christmas. Or, oh, look at those people who do. He's saying, don't, don't get lost in those kind of things. Uh, so that was for free, like your pastor likes to say. Uh, I don't see a lot of it going on, but just enough, I want to remind you, uh, I see so much growth in the way you're learning how to receive one another in all conscience areas. It's, it's beautiful to see the body growing and maturing in these things. And so just a reminder, uh, if you need to put that hat on, wear it. Um, if it fits, and that if the shoe fits, wear it. So if you are struggling in that area, take uh, that exhortation to heart. So what should take up our hearts then during this season uh, or this concept of the birth of Christ? What should we not let this world steal and take away from us with all of its preoccupations on all the wrong things? Our focus is quite simply who it was that lay in the manger on Christmas morning, and that's what we've been laboring here at Southside Bible Church. So I want to go to the Lord and just pray as we're going to look at another beautiful aspect of that child that was born to Bethlehem that morning. Let's go to our God. Oh, Father, I thank you that what I talk about this morning was real in history. God, this is news. This is what actually took place in this world. And I thank you, Lord, let every heart behold it. As we just sang, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. God, I pray that every heart here has had room uh, to receive this king. And I pray, Lord, that for no one this would just be a myth or something that they nod their head to, but that they've seen the glory of the one that was born into that manger and it's eclipsed everything else in their life. And now King Jesus is all. And I pray for every heart here, Lord, that we would deepen in that, that our faith would be made stronger even this morning by a prophecy so clear 700 years before it would take place. May we bow before a God who can control history and bring about your purposes perfectly. God, you should be worshiped. You should be adored and you should be praised for this great salvation that you've given to this world. God, I thank you for it. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray now that your spirit would do what he has been commissioned, that he would shine the floodlight this morning now on Jesus Christ, and that we would stare at him and behold him and believe and be blessed. God, thank you for him. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Our series in Genesis 3, we've been looking at this seed that's been being promised. 
We saw that the, the seed of Eve, uh, right away God promised that he would come and crush the serpent's head for what he did, that he would come and undo the works of the devil in Genesis 3, where he broke the whole design and everything that God has made for this world. And he's going he's gonna to bring a better paradise because the, the one that fell is the new paradise now. We're going to have the full revelation of who God is as this merciful, saving God. And there's going to be a devil that's cast in a pit forever. So there's no more threat of a new fall or anything that could ever come into this new paradise. So the new paradise is better than the old paradise. And we have been brought in to that in Genesis 3 with this promise of what Jesus would do. Then in Genesis 12, there was a promise to Abraham. He calls him out, Abraham, in your seed that's going to come from you, singular, uh, a seed, I'm going to bless the nations. I'm going to bless you, Israel, and I'm going to bless all the nations through this seed who is going to be Jesus Christ. And all who would believe in him would be brought into the promises that God blessed to Abraham. Then we looked in 2 Samuel 7. He said the seed will also come from the seed of David. And this seed is going to sit on a throne like a king. And his kingdom, though, is never going to end. Every other kingdom ends and outlives its power or the king dies. This king is going to live forever. And his kingdom will never come to an end. And it's called the kingdom of God with the perfect king, Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne right now, seated in heaven. And so we've been brought into the kingdom of God. This seed will be a king who lives forever. And now this morning, I want to look at one more aspect of this seed. And it's just, oh, this seed also will happen to be God. So he's going he's gonna to undo Eve. He's going to bless through, through Abraham. And he's going to be a king. But this seed will indeed be God. So a seed is going to come into this world who's going to be a human then, but he's going to be God. And so this mystery just keeps unfolding and getting better and better. So if you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 9, I want to show you the promise of the seed that will be God. And this is one of those passages that I always enjoy looking at again during this season. It's a familiar passage for most of us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a picture. It's the, the words are on many Christmas cards. And songs have been written from this passage, the Handel's Messiah being my favorite. But it's just, it's a glorious passage. And what I would like to do then is I want to set the context of this passage, and really it's that of darkness. The context is that of decay and despair for the nation of Israel. The world is in chaos, it's in turmoil, there's just no light. Just, I like that phraseology, it's just darkness. And, and so the, the world, it can't save itself. It, it doesn't hold the key to fix this great problem that came in Genesis 3. They need help from outside of themselves if they're ever going to get out of this darkness. Just like today, the world is so dark and confused. And it just every time we come up with new ideas and just educate and, and change things and say no to drugs, every possibility, it's not working. It's getting darker and it's just confused and it's just sitting in darkness. And so the light of the world was prophesied here to Israel in Isaiah 9. News was announced, and I'm going to call it the best news. I just love good news, don't you? I, I love when someone calls and says, hey, I got good news for you. If you leave a message and say that, I call back faster. Then I got some bad news for you, pastor. I love good news, and there's just a, a power to news. And I, I've shared this a while back, but I want to share this story again because it grips me about the power of news. Because what we study this morning is news. Near the end of the Second World War, behind enemy lines in Nazi Germany, there were these prison camps. And in these camps, American soldiers were being kept. And in one camp in particular, these prisoners were not well fed, and they were starving and thin and very discouraged. They wondered if they would ever go home again, or if they would ever see another Christmas. And the Nazi guards watched them behind the fences, and their downcast faces and, and slumped over shoulders, scarcely speaking to one another. It was truly a picture of despair. But suddenly one morning everything changed, so it seemed. They were still behind the fences. They were still not well fed and they were still very sick. 
But the guards noticed that some life seemed to be breathed into them. Something changed. They were happy and they were smiling and they were talking to each other. And they were gathered together in little huddles. And you could hear them. They were hooting and hollering. And the guards had no idea what is going on. But they had a little transistor radio that had been smuggled in. And they heard the news that the Allied forces had landed in Normandy. And that they had triumphed. And now they were moving steadfastly inland. And it could be just days before their lease and their liberation was now moving and coming. And so it's just the the power of news. Nothing had changed yet. Except the news uh, awakened hope here in Israel. It's dark and it looks bad. And some news is now going to come to the faithful who are looking for the consolation of Israel. But our context here is where we're going to look at is just a land in darkness in need of some good news. A people uh, dispelled. And, And unbelievable and amazing news is going to be shared with the people of Israel And it will be of a great deliverance, one far greater than Nazi Germany. There's a deliverance that's going to come to all the world, to this son who's going to be born into Bethlehem. It's going to come for an eternal deliverance by a great deliverer. And so this news that's going to be proclaimed to Israel is the meaning then of Christmas. And it's just going to be in a little nutshell for us this morning in verses 6 through 7 of Isaiah 9. So this promised deliverer uh, came into the world that they're talking of. It literally, 700 years later, it was born to a virgin who had come to save sinners. And so, guys, this is the best news that came through Isaiah the prophet. And I want to unpack this diamond of prophecy here this morning, starting uh, just staring at the meaning of the incarnation right in the face. If you've ever wanted to know why did Jesus Christ be born into this world, here it is in a perfect nutshell prophecy 700 years before it ever took place. That should cause you to marvel at a God like this. So let's take a look at this passage. Turn with me then to verse 1. Isaiah 9, 1. But, begins with a but. I don't know about you guys. It it could be translated nevertheless. And most people don't start a sentence with but. And so you say that, that, that isn't it then. So what, it's, it's connecting, it's continuing on the thought. And it's continuing on the thought of Isaiah 7 through 8. (coughs) What's going on is Israel it has this kind of form of religion. It's external. And Isaiah says, but God says this to, through Isaiah, your hearts are far from me. You're doing all the external things, but your heart is so distant and absent in what you're doing. You're doing your religious rituals, but your lives didn't want God to dwell in them and be the center place. You, the old saying, you wanted his gifts, but you didn't want the giver. That's what was going on in Israel, and that's what's going on in our nation today. So God has chastised them. He, he wanted, he's a jealous God. And he sought to, to turn their hearts back to worshiping him. And they won't. They're happy with their religion After all, a little religion never hurt no one. And they're just very content in that. As long as I've got my religion and my external things, everything is fine. So God calls Isaiah, go to them and proclaim judgment on the house of Israel for what they're doing. And in chapter 7 through 8, it gets very historical. And it comes and says, God has brought the house of Israel together in David. And then David sins. And it's a divided house. And you now have Israel and you have Judah. You have a northern and a southern kingdom in Israel. And there's great enmity really between the two kingdoms. And Israel then, as they go and they say, we're going to get an alliance with Syria to come and lay Judah waste. So we're going to sign them up and do a little, you know, uh, I can't think of the word, but we're going to bring them and they're going to help us. And then King Ahaz in the other kingdom, out of fear of this threat, he goes and makes an alliance with Assyria, who is the world power of that time. So they're they're both jockeying for position. And God has promised Judah, I will protect you. And so Isaiah now comes to Ahaz, then the king, and says, don't do this with Assyria. God will establish your house. Ask God for a sign 
of his commitment to bless you. In Isaiah 7, 14, he gives him a sign and he says that you're going to have a child who's going to be born to you and his name is going to be Emmanuel. God is with us. Here's a sign, a virgin having a baby named Emmanuel. But Ahaz goes through with his plan anyways. And he's told now that Assyria will come and wipe out Israel and the Assyrians, but then he's going to come and he's going to wipe you out as well. Yet God, who is the faithful one, will still bring about a restoration. God's commitment to put David on the throne will continue. And in him, Israel will be restored, and so will the nation. And we come then to Isaiah 9. And Israel now is is famished. And they're under great suffering for what has come. Uh, Where they're at now in this context is they curse the king and they curse God. They're they're just broken. They're mad at the king. They're mad at God for this chastisement and the suffering and the famine and all that they're facing. And so they come now and they look out at the earth and all they see is distress and gloom and brokenness and poverty and suffering and pain. They're, They're crushed under a great famine. And just think of all the psychological and the physical stress that goes with such a difficult time. For some of you, you don't even have to work hard because you're under it this morning. And it's so hard and difficult. That's what they're facing. That's what they're sitting in this day. And they're looking for help everywhere. Look at chapter 8 of Isaiah. And I want to look at verse 19. When they say to you, Here's what they're doing for comfort. Consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. Should not a people consult their God? You're running to spiritists or dead people when you can come to the living God and get counsel. You're looking for anything you can find. Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, is it because they have no dawn? They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished. And it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. And then they will look to the earth. They're going to look to the earth for their hope. And behold, here's what they're going to see. Distress and darkness. The gloom of anguish. And they'll be driven away into darkness. The more that they keep looking to the earth for help, They just keep seeing darkness. It's a very bleak picture of what we're looking at. It's truly the picture of the land right before the Lord came and what we're studying next week in Luke 1. Israel then was lost and apostate. They had corrupted leaders with Rome and corrupted religion. They were a nation that was just lost and confused and they They dwelt in great darkness and they hadn't heard from from God for 400 years. And so the same kind of picture, and I believe the same picture as we sit here this morning in our world that we live in. Well, then chapter 9 is dropped into that landscape. Nevertheless, but there's a light. There's a dawn. God erupts into the situation And he brings light from outside into this dark world. He brings good news of glad tidings of good things. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at this text and I want to learn the true message of Christmas. And maybe this morning you could discover the light that could dispel your darkness that you are feeling this morning. I've prayed for some of you here this morning that are sitting in this darkness this light this morning might break in and it might dispel all of your darkness and gloom as you keep looking to this world to find hope and help and you just can't find it. I'm giving you your remedy here this morning if that's you uh, sitting with us. I've prayed for you. Some of you, by hard providences this morning, are feeling darkness and I've prayed for you that light would break in As you look at the picture of what God has done for us, as some of you have faced some really hard providences, and Christmas highlights it and makes it feel deeper and and darker. And, And this morning, I'm just asking God to let this light 
shine into your hearts and lift your burdens and add hope and encouragement to his beautiful plan and what he's doing in our lives. So let's, let's look at this in verses one through two. Here's our first part of the outline is Isaiah is going to show us the nature then of Israel's distress in verses one through two. Let's look at it. <clears throat> but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Christmas means the world is a dark place. That's what Isaiah is painting for us this morning. The people are walking in darkness. They can't understand anything because without God, nothing makes sense. Without Christ, we can have all of our moral agendas and do everything we want. So Christmas is a time we try to make it a nice and better place and happier, and it, it just makes everyone more depressed. But at the end of the day, all this work and effort, it, it's just still selfish. It's still a dark, lost world that just can't find its way. There's a proverb that says, like a man in the darkness, they don't know over what they stumble. It's just dark, and they're stumbling over life and trying to find pleasure outside of Christ. And it's just confusing and stumbling, and they can't figure it out. The world has lost its way. It just doesn't have the key to fix it. But later on in Isaiah, he's going to say, we all, like sheep, have gone astray and each of us has turned to his own way. We, we've looked to our own way to fix it, our own purposes, uh, self as the king. And all it, all it is is dark. It produces darkness. And these men are coming to the right conclusions because this world is a very dark place. Without Isaiah, if you, I think it was Spurgeon, he said, if you take Christ out of the Bible, it's a very dark book. You take Christ out of this world and it's a very dark world. Very dark I pray that you would see that this day. The Christmas celebration just keeps making it darker for you. But Christianity, as it looks at this world now in truth, this dark place has a nevertheless. It has a but now. God has done something to come shine into this darkness and give us the light of the world and change everything. We have a but now. We weren't left in this darkness and despair and wrath and, and just sin nature's night and all of those things. There's this amazing light. There's an amazing comfort that if God will do what he said he would do in this promise, you have great hope here this morning. And so it boils down to this. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was born into this world. He came in and he died on a cross in our place. And he was buried and he was resurrected and he was raised and put at the right hand of God in all authority. And he says, I'm coming again to establish this eternal kingdom. And then there's all light and joy and peace with that diamond entering this world. And so if this is true, there's light and there's comfort and there's peace for no matter where you're at in the middle of this darkness as you gaze upon Christ. If it's not true, there's darkness and despair and death. Get your 80 years in. Try to deceive yourself that something will actually make sense or make you happy. And it will just be a dark, discouraging, sad, lonely journey. And so I preach to you this morning, the light of the world that I can give hope to every heart. So I want you to notice from our text in verse 1, as he talks there about Zebulun and Naphtali are feeling the oppression of an alien invader, and that alien invader is the Assyrians. They're, they're coming in, they're making their presence felt, and, and this is the context of the prophecy. Just here they come, we're about to be destroyed. But in this, he says, all of a sudden, they're going to see a great light. There's a great light uh, in prophecy Matthew 4, written 700 years later, it, it, there, there's a wilderness and Satan just tempted Jesus and he won. The second Adam entered in and he won. And, and Jesus, flip over to Matthew 4. I just want to read that to you. Matthew 4, verse 12. 
The second Adam defeated the devil in his temptations. And, and now Jesus comes into Nazareth. He goes into Galilee. He's preaching the gospel. And I just want you to hear, uh, start in verse 12, Matthew 4, 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people were sitting in darkness and they saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death upon them, a light dawned, Isaiah 9. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is fulfilled. The light has come. The kingdom is here. The new kingdom, the king of the kingdom has come. So it's absolutely amazing. 700 years later, Jesus coming to the earth saying, you remember Isaiah 9? Here it is. That, that light has come. And he began preaching the gospel. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn. Come to me. Look to me. And this fulfills what we're looking at in Isaiah 9. And I want you to notice, just listen to a couple other New Testament writers as they catch on to this. Luke 1, You know what? I'm going to skip a couple of them because I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to read Luke 2, 29. Now, Lord, this is uh, Simeon. Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy soterion, thy salvation as he's holding baby Jesus, which thou has prepared in the presence of all peoples. And then he quotes Isaiah 9, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, John, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And John 1, 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Oops, I just read the same one, sorry. I just, I just saved some time by printing that out twice. <laughs> they got that Jesus came and fulfilled this. He was the light that Isaiah prophesied of for those who are walking in darkness. And in Luke 4, it's stunning that he tells us Jesus was walking the earth and preaching the gospel. Jesus Christ fulfills this prophecy 700 years later, here it is. He's just saying it's fulfilled. This is what you've been waiting for. So my friends, Jesus is the light of the world. And he came into our darkness to give us deliverance from sin and its slavery and all of the consequences that came from Genesis 3. The light came in to undo the works of the devil. And so whether you lived in 733 BC at the time of the prophecy where there was great darkness or in Palestine at the first century when Jesus walked the earth or if you sit here this morning at Southside Bible Church, this is for you. This is for you this morning. The light has come into the world to lift us out of darkness and to bring us to that glorious light, the presence of God. So our first point that is the nature then of Israel's distress, judgment, consequences, darkness, looking to the earth to find hope and they can find nothing and just a, a promise that a light will come. And I want to look at the second point then is it's going to bring an increase to their joy. Their joy is going to increase. Look with me in verse 3. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness 
of a harvest. Nothing better for a farmer than the harvest time. You're going to be glad like that as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, when they conquer a nation and take their goods. You're going to, your gladness is going to increase and enlarge. Verse 4, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning and fuel for the fire. You're going to just wipe out all their enemies. And so Israel starts talking to God and he's telling them what they will say to God. I'm sorry, Israel, Isaiah. He's talking to God and he's telling them this is what they will say to God after God has revealed his salvation that we've seen in this passage this morning. God's salvation will expand his people's joy. He unburdens them from all their distresses of sin and living in darkness and the pain and the suffering that comes. I'm going to break that bondage, the the sin that all you've ever known being under its dominion. I'm going to come with that light and I'm going to break that off of you. It's going to come off your shoulders. The shackles are going to fall off of, of nature's night. This is just Joy in God and in his salvation, that's what's being promised. Darkness, sadness, sorrow, no hope. And this light's going to come and he's going to break the bondage and all the darkness and the pain that comes and the consequences of sin. And he's going to wash you and cleanse you and restore you and bring you back to God. And he's going to just take your gladness and it's going to explode when this king comes into this world. And I get two lessons from this. And we haven't even got to the passage I wanted to talk about. Sorry. The the context is where you put this diamond. If you don't put it on this, you're going to miss the glory of this diamond. So keep working with me. Uh, I, I just, salvation produces joy in hearts. That's what he's telling us. Sinners being saved. When we realize our own salvation of what God has delivered us from and what he saved us from. I pray you know a testimony and a salvation. He's a saving God. His name is Jesus and he'll save his people from their sins. And when you have a testimony of knowing how deep your sins were and the consequences and the wrath and laboring under law, not being able to get the guilt and shame off, when God finally let you see that glory and that beauty in Christ, it just brings joy. (laughs) And it brings joy. Every time I see another soul surrender their life to Jesus Christ, my joy is made full. The Jews were not rejoicing in the Gentile salvation that's being promised. That's a sign they didn't get it. They hated that. Jonah, I'm not going to preach to them. They're going to repent. And you're such a forgiving God, you're going to forgive them. I'm not going to do that. So this is a season to stop and say, what then is my joy in? If that's the promise of what this prophecy is going to do, what is your joy in this morning? It's a very hard question that you can deceive yourself very easily upon. And I just want you to wrestle with it maybe this week. What is my joy set upon? Is it in a job? Possessions? Social connections? Or probably most importantly, a a circumstance? Is my joy set on my circumstances What is my joy set upon? And Isaiah 9 is drawing us to say there's there's this main joy that it must be set upon. And it's going to increase your gladness when you see your salvation in this promised one. So I pray it's our greatest joy. It's in our salvation. And it's in our watching him save others. That's where my joy is found and watching this kingdom advance. Everything is about that what he's done to save me and what he's doing to save others and how I can participate in this great commission. Do you have that joy in your heart? Or is that the focus of your life? How can I bring the gospel to others? What a season to reach out. Get out in the malls. Get outside. This is the time to share and talk. People will talk about it like never before. This is a time where people feel their darkness more than ever. And I want us to wake up and take advantage of this season. This Christmas, 
we're going to celebrate our own salvation that God gave to us. The joy of when you knew you were acquitted and accepted by God. The joy in seeing others come. Did you give, uh, did, do you give your time and possessions for this? This is a good season to ask these questions. Joy is not a side issue. What's the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever? And I, I want every one of you to ask, is my joy in what we're about to look at in Isaiah 9? Or is the reason you have no joy because it's everything else that you find your joy in? This can't be taken away. It's eternal. This is God's salvation. I want you to find joy no matter what you've been through this morning, but the eyes of faith and the beauty and the glory of this Savior. Is our worship the expression of this joy? God is the one who gives us joy. You can't manufacture it. He gives it. And there's only one way to get it. To see this darkness without him and to see the light that came into this world to give us salvation, repent and believe and be filled with joy of a reconciliation with God for eternity. Or is your life a humbug? I want you to go wrestle. You, what's my saying? I hate to keep wearing them out. Lemon-sucking Christian. <laughs> what are you this morning? Let this take you away and rapture you up to joy that can go beyond every circumstance. And I think you can have joy and grieve and be sorrowful. There's a lot of things that can go at the same time, but you've got to have joy and what we're looking at this morning. Third, third point then is um, we've looked at there's a nature, the nature of Israel's distress. We've looked at it's the salvation is going to come and it's going to increase joy. It's going to grow and explode. And now our last point is salvation always produces then, I'm sorry, the third point is the promised Messiah. There's now, here we get to the good stuff. So all that's building, and it's all been building to this diamond of verses 6 through 7 that again is on every Christmas card, but I want it to be on your heart. Okay, let's look at it. He is the reason for the joy. There's no other place to get joy than verses 6 through 7, and I want to read them to you. Four, a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government is going to rest on his shoulders. His name, what's his name? It's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with what? Justice and righteousness. We've been waiting for a kingdom like this. Perfect king, perfect justice, perfect righteousness in this kingdom. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's look at it in 10 minutes. Greatest verse maybe in the Bible. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and I'm going to call this the gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah should be right there with those four books. So let's look at it for a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. So a child would be born into the world. There's going to be a child who's going to come into the world like any other human being. And he would be conce conceived in a mother's womb. And he's going to, there's going to be labor, and he's going, to, he's going to be birthed through the birth canal. And he's going to come and, and be subjected then to our limitations with humanity. And he has to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with man. He's going to get thirsty and tired and hungry. He, he wept and he slept. He was fully man. He was the seed that we studied. He had to come from Eve he had to come from Abraham. He had to come from the seed of David. And here it is, that seed is going to be conceived into this world. A son will be given to us, which preaches his preexistence. His life preceded coming into the world. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. 
And the Word was God. This, this one existed with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit for all of eternity in perfect fellowship. And He's now, that one is going to come into this world. He was given to us. I love that. He, the greatest gift ever given was God gave His Son. He so loved this cosmos, he gave his son and he came in through a birth canal, born as a human being into this world. This prophecy in their darkness is in the middle of it all, a ruler is going to be born to govern us for our best interests. And contrast that for Israel with all the wicked kings that they've seen. They've seen bad king after bad king. Uh, They make an altar to Molech. Molech, and they're coming and they're burning their children and sacrificing them to appease Molech. And the king's over it and putting his hand on it. What kind of rulers are those? You're going to have a ruler, Israel, with the best heart, who's going to rule for the well-being of the people. And he's going to have perfect wisdom and justice and love and sovereignty. He's the king that we've always dreamed of and that everyone has always wanted. Israel, you're going to have the king of kings. And the government will rest on his shoulders, which shows us this this little baby is going to have absolute sovereignty over everything. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to him. He is the greater son of David. And he will rule over all providence. And the heart of every king is in this one's hand. And he turns it wherever he wishes. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the unrivaled, sovereign, supreme king of all of creation. And the government will rest on his shoulders. Human history and nations are on his shoulders. And he will bring all of history to its climactic end where he's going to be exalted and worshiped forever. He has the ultimate throne and every other rule or any kind of authority comes under this king. This is a pretty big promise, isn't it? The government will rest on his shoulders. And secondly, I want you to see his name. Your your name would describe who you are and the character of who you are. So the name of someone was very important. And I want you to see what is going to be the name of this son that you're going to give to us. Ahaz... The king is crafty, he's deceitful, and he's shrewd. He he, he was not godly or wise. He didn't care for the people. And this first name then is going to be wonderful counselor. This ruler will be wise. He's going to have a supernatural wisdom. He's going to have omniscience. And he's always, he's going to have God at the center of everything that he says, does, or think, or accomplishes. The glory of God will be his main purpose for everything. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So this this ruler is going to have perfect wisdom, the mind of Christ, infinite knowledge, the best ruler. Even in the fulfillment of this passage, the the context is all these temptations. And and, and remember when we read Luke 4, Satan comes to tempt Jesus in the garden and he couldn't get him to move away from his trust in his father. Here, make bread, jump off this cliff and everything he could do. There was a son who would not quit trusting his father. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I shall raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. He will rule his people with heavenly wisdom. He will be a wonderful counselor. I think of Solomon and all of his wisdom and how amazing it was that it's just like a little drop in the water to God's perfect, infinite wisdom of this ruler and this king who rules over every one of us who are children of God this morning. So the one with the government on his shoulders is going to have perfect wisdom. He knows what is best for every situation, every situation. He has complete control with the wisdom to know how to bring the future about perfectly according to plan for God's glory. This is the one who was given to us. We can have counsel from him as we journey this life to our true home. I have a king with perfect wisdom. We have the mind of Christ and his word and his spirit to guide us. 
What a blessing to be in the kingdom of God who has a king who's a wonderful counselor. Amazing. That should take your breath away. As a counselor, I'll spend many sleepless nights going, what do I say? Did I say the right thing? Oh God, what will help them? What am I missing? And I can spend a whole night sometimes wrestling with that. Counseling is to lead people to the wonderful counselor who always knows the right thing and the perfect thing for you. What a ruler. I love submitting to one with perfect wisdom. And I just want to give you one other name. His name's also going to be Mighty God. (laughs) New Testament's all over this. His name will be Mighty God. John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Titus 2.13, we are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And this Son will be named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. A child will be given to us, but he'll be like no one else who was ever born into this world. He's going to be mighty God. So the son will be given through a virgin's womb, but he's going to be mighty God. Mighty God. He then has the power to bring to pass the counsel then that he gives to us. He speaks and it's so. He opens a door that no one can shut and he shuts a door that no one can open. He creates out of nothing. He sustains the universe, it says, with the word of his power. He forgives sins. He raises the dead. He has power over judgment. The one in that manger was God. This baby was the God, the God man. And he came to bring God and man back together. Fully God and fully man. Let that take your breath away. The wisdom of God to come up with such a plan to bring light into our darkness and to bring salvation to the world. The next name he gives to him is eternal father. And the cults have had a feeding ground on this phrase, eternal father. But the the, the rulers, I want you to just get this, the rulers, the kings in those days uh, to the nations, they were called fathers. They, they, they were considered our fathers, the, the rulers o- over us. The, some of them were even spiritual fathers. And so to, to rule over the people in this way, he's going to be the eternal father. This one who's promised to us will be fatherly. He'll care for the well-being of his flock like a father for his family. He will rule very fatherly in every sense of the word. He's going to come and he will care for us. Let let that grip you. I was meeting with a dear brother this week and we were just being blessed over Psalm 23. The Lord is your shepherd. And so here it is. This this fatherly one is going to shepherd you and take care of you like a sheep and cause you to lay down in green pastures and bring you to the eternal home safe and sound. I just marvel at the fatherliness One other thought is the literal Hebrew says father of eternity. And in Micah 5, 2, his going forth are from long ago. So he's the the father of eternity. His birth was eternity stepping into time. So there's this eternality to him as well. And 1 John, it calls him with a definite article. He's the eternal life, the, the one who gives life. He's the eternal one. So it could be bringing out that aspect as well of the eternality of this salvation and this Christ that will be given to you, the eternal life. And then the other name that will be given to the son is the Prince of Peace. He's a wonderful counselor. He's an eternal God who can bring it to pass. He's an eternal father then with this eternal perspective on all things. And so as we follow the path that his counsel lays out, what he will give to you guys is peace. As you come to this king and surrender and follow and trust, it it brings a peace that passes all understanding. The Hebrew word is that word we love, shalom. It means prosperity, well-being, blessing. I like the phrase wholeness. 
It, just, it, it brings back from the curse where we fell a, a wholeness of just being right with God and having light and understanding this world and what he's doing and where he's moving all of it is it, it, it brings wholeness. It, it brings a calmness, uh, an absence of fear to come under this Prince of Peace. This world, if I could characterize it, is in Romans 3, there's no fear of God in their eyes. They don't fear God and they fear everything else. And they, they run. it says the wicked flee when no one's chasing and they're always running from something afraid and anxious. And this one will bring peace. He's the prince of peace that everything is right with God and secured and set for my eternal blessings. I'm under this shepherd. And all I can do is I gaze at this one, it brings peace. He alone can make us whole in his blessings. On Christmas, there's more unhappiness and depression and despair than I've seen at any time in the world. The Prince of Peace is born into the world and all I see is a lack of peace at this time. How can anyone live a moment on this earth without this Christ and the peace that he brings. The fear of living in a world filled with chaos and dysfunction and danger. This world, if I take Christ out of it, it scares me to death. It's, it's awful. It just brings anxiety. It's fear. You take God away and it's nothing but fear. How do you live like that? How do you make it? Oh, his name will be the Prince of Peace. Shh. Peace over your conscience of guilt and separation from God and reconciliation. Do you need him to whisper into your troubled heart this morning like those waves when he said, shh. As it just let the Prince of Peace, whatever you've walked in here with, I have been praying for that all week. Some of you have some huge trials and I want the Prince of Peace, just look at him. And in his perfect, wonderful wisdom and eternal father, just let peace Come over that he's got you. You're one with him. Prince of Peace. The question that's been asked again and again in every language and in every place on the globe and in every generation is where can hope be found? And there was a moment in time when the hope of the whole universe rested in one place in this little town in Palestine. And it was in a little stable with a baby that was born into Bethlehem. And Christianity declares that there is hope in this person and his light can shine into your darkness and he can expand your gladness. Nothing else. This one. And it's in Isaiah 9 that a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and the Prince of Peace. And there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. We'll just keep going. Hope is not found in yourself. It is not found in another person. And it will not be found in a change of circumstances. Hope rests on the shoulder of one person the one that Isaiah has just laid out to us this morning. A dark, dead time. Is there any hope? Well, in that major is the world's hope. Nothing lies outside of this hope. Corey Ten Boone, who was put into a prison camp with her sister and her family and during uh, the Nazi regime as well that I began this sermon with, their life was really as dark as it could be. They're watching loved ones be killed and they're starving and they've got no hope. The pit was so deep. And sister said to sister, there's no pit so deep that Jesus isn't deeper. There's a peace in him that you can't measure it. Height, depth, breadth, or length. No matter where you're at, no matter what, there's a deeper peace in the Prince of Peace that can be found in beholding Him and looking at Him and Him alone. You cannot get outside of His jurisdiction. I'm telling you, there is no height or depth or breadth or length that can separate you from the love of Christ. 
there's hope here this morning in this beautiful one that was born for us. And my last point, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. In verse 7, we're told the zeal of the Lord will bring this prophecy to pass. Psalm 124.8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Our help, our hope is in this name. This hope is sure, not because of what they do, but because of who is behind this promise. The promise is being made by God himself through the prophet. And so as Robin was preaching in Hebrews, God takes an oath and he swears. He can't lie. He's going to bring this about. My zeal will accomplish this promise. Our enemies cannot undo us. No matter how sore, tired, or worn out you are this morning, they're just no match for the fervor of the sovereignty of God. There's no match for it. God's zeal for you and this promise and this purpose is there's a zeal that he's going to bring it to pass. I will do this. 700 years later, true to his promise, God did this. And his son was born into a manger in a virgin's womb. And the light of the world was born into this fallen world to those who were walking in darkness. There was no one even noticed it. They'd ignore him. And they groped for God, the Israelites. They couldn't find him. They couldn't find deliverance with any of their alliances. They couldn't get deliverance through the law. They tried so hard through the law to get deliverance, through their own flesh, through being moral, through the world, asking the mediums and the spiritists, and through indulgence and through trying to find security. They couldn't find peace. And so in stepped a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That is the true meaning of Christmas. And so I pray this morning that we would hark the herald and we would join with the angels and we would sing because the son was given and that our joy would just be magnified. Our gladness would be fulfilled and, and just exemplified because of what God has given to us. So let's look away from the darkness, any hope outside of anything else and this beautiful, glorious promise that God has given to us in Christ. We have everything. Every spiritual blessing has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this unbelievable promise. As we've been looking at this seed and who he would be is amazing. That he would undo the work of a devil. That he would be the way you would bless us through Abraham. That he would be the king that we've always wanted. And now this morning that this one who would be born in the world would be God. And so, God, thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for your zeal to bring this to pass. Thank you for your zeal to bring to pass that the nations would call upon this seed and believe and be saved. Thank you for every salvation in this room, God, that you, you uh, invaded our darkness. And you opened our eyes so that we could see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Father, we receive him. We believe. And we thank you for this gift. And I pray now with our days and our resources that they would be given to shine this light, that others would see the glory of God in the face of Christ. God, thank you for the privilege of telling those who sit in darkness of the great light that was born into this world 2,000 years ago and is coming again soon to shine that light where there'll be no more sun because we will bask in it for all of eternity. God, we thank you for this glorious hope and promise. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.